good to be back with you tonight. I'm, I'm thankful again to have been able to be with you today. It's just kind of weird standing up here and there being such a small crowd. Uh, you announced I was preaching, I guess. And everybody got sick and didn't want to come. No, I'm just kidding. I hope everyone that's, I know several of them are watching, they text me this afternoon and uh, hopefully they will be better, be able to be back with you the next week. My family's not with me tonight. Heather has to teach Bible Bowl on Sunday afternoon at 4.30, so that's where her and Lena are at, studying for Bible Bowl. So hopefully tonight we'll discuss something that will benefit you. I want you to think about the world with me for just a moment, and I want you to think about how many people there are in the world. It's told that there are almost 8 billion people, if that is anywhere near correct, I don't know how they even come up with the number, but But there's a lot of people in the world, and and we would all agree with that. There's a lot of people even in this small area. And when it comes to a a lot of different people, we're we're all different, right? We're all very, very different people, and, and we like different things. We do different things. We look different. And just everything about us is different. But sometimes, sometimes we don't like being different, do we? Sometimes in, when it comes to life, we kind of want to be like everybody else, but, but where's the fun in that? Where's the excitement in that? If everybody was exactly the same, where would the enjoyment be in life? You see, God made us different. And I want to think about that tonight, but yet I want to look at it in a different way. Are you a, a different kind of spirit? Within you, your whole motivation, your, your life, the way you project yourself to other people, is it different? Do people look at you when they come in contact with you and, and do they think, you know, they're a little bit different? And, and not in a bad way, but I'm talking about in, in a good way. As a Christian, we should stand out to people that we're different. If we blend in and we are just like everybody else, we're not what God would have us to be. God expects us to have a different spirit about us. Tonight we're going to go to the Old Testament. I love to preach and teach from the Old Testament. And we're going to go to the book of Numbers and we're going to go to chapter 13 and 14 and and we're going to talk about the children of Israel and and how they sent out the, the 12 spies, but we're going to focus on Caleb. And we're going to learn some lessons of of what made him different. In fact, in chapter 14, verse 24, God paid Caleb a compliment. He said, my servant Caleb, he has a a, a different spirit about him. He's not like everybody else. And brethren, I don't know if you realize it, but that was an awesome thing. Caleb and Joshua were different. And they were rewarded for being different, I can tell you tonight, if you will learn to be a different kind of individual and not like everybody else, it, it will pay off in the end. God re- will reward you abundantly. Let's go to Numbers chapter 13, if you will, and we're going to begin to learn some lessons. Before we get to verse 30, let's get a little background. Let, let's see what's going on. I know maybe not everybody's very familiar with the story. But chapter 13 opens, and the Bible says, The Lord spoke to Moses, and He said, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan. Let's stop just a second. God tells Moses, Hey, gather up these people. I want you to go spy out the land. But was this God's idea? You see, sometimes that we we think it was God's idea. Sometimes we think God came up with this, and, and He needed these people to go figure out what's going on, but... If you would, hold your place there and turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 1. And let's see the the full picture, if you will. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, we're going to begin in in verse 20. And we're going to see whose idea this was, to spy out the land. In verse 20 it says, And I said unto ye, to you, Ye are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give us. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it. As the Lord thy God of thy fathers hath said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. God's command was, Here you are. I've brought you to this place. Go take it. I've given it to you. I've provided everything you need. Now it's your job. Go possess it. 
And I want you to notice what the people said. Verse 22. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and you said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land and bring us word again by what way we must go up and into what cities we shall come. Now let's stop just a second. We're finished in the book of Deuteronomy. But God said, hey, I've said it before you. I've given you everything you need. Go take it. What do people say? Eh, I don't know about that, God. I don't know about that. Maybe we need to go about it in a different way. Sometimes we do that, don't we? Sometimes we see exactly what God said, but maybe we want to go about it in a different way. So the children of Israel, they got their way. And often God let people have their way, but He did it to teach them a valuable lesson. And in this instance, it's, there's no difference. God allowed the people to have their way to send out spies, and the purpose was to teach them a lesson. And it's going to be a hard lesson. It's going to be a lesson that's going to cost a lot of people a lot of things. So go back to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. So God allowed them, verse 2, to send spies into the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel and for every tribe of their fathers. Send you a man. You got 12 tribes? Pick one man from each tribe and, and send him out. Verse 3, Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all those men whose head were the children of Israel. The only verse, for time's sake, I'm going to focus on is verse 6. Of the tribe of Judah, Caleb was selected. He's going to be the focus of our study tonight. This man, Caleb. So skip on down to verse 17. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And he said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain. He says, and see the land. Moses says, I want you to look at it. God's told us all about it, but I, I want you to go see it for yourself. I want you to see what it is. I want you to see the kind of people that dwell there, whether they're strong or weak, whether they're few or many. He says, I want you to see what the land is that they dwell in. Is it a good land or a bad land? What cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. See what the land is, whether it is fat or lean, whether there is good therein or not. He says, and be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. You know, when we look at this in our human wisdom, we say, man, that, that's smart. We need to go in, we need to figure out. What are we getting ourselves into? But here's the problem. God already told them what they're getting themselves into. I'm bringing you a land that flows with milk and honey. I'm going to give you all of it. All you've got to do is possess it. But again, they come back to the idea, yeah, God, I know you said that, but, but I, I need to be able to see it for myself. I, I need to go in and I need to make a battle plan, although God had already made the battle plan. But the people, again, they got their way. Verse 21 they went up, they searched the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob as men came to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came to Hebron and to all these other cities. Verse 23, they came to the brook of Ishkel and they cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes that they bear between two men upon a staff. So it is an amazing place. It is just like God said. Verse 25, they returned from searching the land after 40 days. 40 days, that's God's testing period. Over and over and over again. He's going to test these people for 40 days. He's going to see if they're going to come back and say, well, God said we can take it and surely we can. Well, verse 26, they went and they came to Moses and they came to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and they brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation. And they showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and they said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely, surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit thereof. Here's what they decided. Hey, it's just what God said. He told us how it was, and wow, he was right. Imagine that. God was right. Well, they figured it out. But notice verse 28. The tone changes. Man, we went and we saw it, and it's just what God told us. But verse 28, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great, and moreover we saw the children of Anak there. 
The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. I want you to picture this. These people have seen all of the amazing things that God has done, and they see what a great land it is, and God says you can have it, but all of a sudden, can't do it. Can't do it. But in verse 30, Caleb speaks up. And we're going to begin to learn several lessons from the things that Caleb said. We're going to learn why God said he had a different spirit than everybody else. He said he could have came back and he could have went right along with the crowd, and we're going to talk about that. He could have gave him the same report. Caleb's a different guy. He's a different guy, and he's not afraid to speak out. Verse 30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses, and he said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Brethren, Caleb was a man who walked by faith. When Caleb learned what he needed to learn, he obeyed immediately. Why don't we do that? Why don't we do that? You ever thought about that? Why don't we... I don't know what I'm doing. I'm skipping around everywhere. Put this down and leave it alone. When he learned what he needed to know, he was ready to go. But sometimes, church, we, we don't do that. You know how many times that, that I've preached a lesson and people come up to me and they say, man, I needed that lesson. And I need to make this change in my life. And, and that's just what I needed. And you know what happens? Nothing. Nothing. You do the exact same thing in the exact same way. You act the same. Maybe you, you preach on forsaking the assembly and somebody comes up and says, oh man, I, I, need to do, I need to do better. And that is just what I needed. And now they know what they need to do and they won't be back that night. And they won't be back the next week. You see, so many times we are a people that put things off in our life. So many times we wait for a convenient season. That sounds familiar, right? That's what Felix said to the Apostle Paul. So many times in our life we are like Pharaoh when, when Pharaoh was approached about the frogs in Egypt and, and then Moses said, well, when do you want me to get rid of, rid of the frogs? You're going to do what God says? Okay, when are you going to get rid of the frogs? What do you say? Tomorrow. We want to put it off. Why don't we, once we know what it is that we need to do, why don't we do it? Caleb knew. Caleb knew what God would have him to do. And once he had the knowledge of that, he says, let's go. Let's not put it off anymore. Let's not procrastinate. But yet, we live in a society that procrastinates. We are a people that do that. We've got people that have sit in the pews of the church building year after year after year that are not New Testament Christians. Although they know, they know exactly what it is that they need to do. They've heard it time and time again. They've read it in their own Bibles, but yet they just put it off. And what happens the longer you put things like that off? Well, it becomes easier and easier to put it off. And before you know it, you're not going to do it. Church, I'm going to tell you, when we learn what it is that we need to do in this life, whatever it may be, immediately we're going to be held accountable by that. We're going to give account for what it is that we know and, and the Bible talks about that. He says, he who knew his master's will and he didn't do it, well, he's going to be beaten with many stripes. Oh, no, there's going to be some people that don't know and yet they're still going to be beaten, but the punishment is going to be far less severe so once we gain knowledge, we've got to obey immediately. I learned that from Caleb. He was a man that was ready to act. Go back to this morning's sermon. He was a man that had a, a fire within him, and he was ready to obey. He wasn't going to put it off. He understood that that didn't accomplish anything in life. Number two, he had a positive attitude. Positive attitude. Go back to your Bible. <clears throat> Again, verse 30, let's go through verse 33. Remember, the people are being very negative. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and he said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Now hold on a minute. They're stronger than we are. Had these people actually fought their own battles up to this point? What had they done up to this point? 
all they had done is they had, accom- or they had seen God accomplish amazing things. They had seen every one of those ten plagues in Egypt. They had saw what God had done. They had watched the Red Sea divide. They had walked across on dry land. They had seen the, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. They had watched water come forth out of a rock, enough water to give a couple million people something to drink. They had watched God rain down manna and send quail from heaven again enough to feed a few million people. And now all of a sudden they say, wow, these people are stronger than us. You have done nothing up to this point. God has provided everything and God has just told you, I'll give it to you. Go possess it. It's yours. But yet they say, now, no, they're stronger than we are. They're not stronger than their God. But they didn't realize that. Verse 32, And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. How many of you have ever seen a land that eats anybody? You don't see that, do you? They're just making things up now. Because they, they just don't want to do it. And they're very negative. The land eats it up. Land doesn't do anything. And all the people we saw in it were men of great stature. Great stature. Well, was everybody they seen a, a, a giant? No. Again, it's exaggerated negativity. Everybody in the land is ten foot tall and looks like Goliath. That's not true. Again, very negative individuals. Verse 33, And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which came, come to the giants, and we were in our own sight. I want you to notice that. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. They had a small eye on themselves, a big eye on their enemies, and no eye on God. I wrote that note in my Bible many years ago. They weren't concerned about God. All they were concerned about was themselves. They had the grasshopper complex, and and they had no faith. They were a very, very negative people. I want to ask you something. Do we live in a negative society? Some of you watch the news, right? And when you turn on the news, what percent of the news is negative? Ten out of twelve people in this situation were very negative. That's about 84%. Would you say about 84% of the news is negative? Probably so, right? Why are we such a negative people? Why is it that, that we don't spread good things, but if we hear something bad, what do we immediately want to do with it? Well, we want to, we want to take that and spread it everywhere else, right? Negativity seems to, to grow and to multiply amongst people. You've got 12 people went to spy out the land, two came back with a very positive attitude, 10 came back with a negative attitude, and those 10 people turned the nation against God the nation against God. But I want you to notice something we learn about Caleb. You realize Caleb could have given in right here? He could have said, eh, you know what? Man, that, those other guys are, are being negative. I just really need to follow suit. And, and sometimes, isn't that how we are? Sometimes maybe we try to be a, a positive person and maybe we try to look at the good side of things, but sometimes when people around us are being very negative, sometimes we're influenced. And sometimes it changes our whole mindset. And brethren, it shouldn't do that. We should not allow that. We've got to be a person like Caleb that is different. If we want to be like everybody else, yeah, follow suit. Go right ahead. But you will never be a different spirit following suit. And you've got to understand that. By the way, I, I want to ask something else. Did not 12 men see the exact same thing? Didn't they hear the exact same thing? Didn't they have the exact same experience? No doubt these 12 men are in a group and they're camping together and they're going out every day together. They saw the exact same thing. Why is it that, that us as Christians, why is it we can be a part of the same congregation, we can hear the same sermon, we can pray together as a group. We can sing together as a group. Why is it that some of us can look at it as positive and some of us look at it as negative? Why is that? 
It comes back to us, doesn't it? It comes back to what is within you. What is within me. It comes back to what kind of spirit do you and I have. And we've got to make that decision. And I can learn from Caleb if I want to be a different spirit. If I want God to commend me for the things that I do, then I've got to realize I can't be influenced by the negativity. I can't be a person that complains. Man, how many, how many complainers do you think sit in pews week after week after week? A lot, right? How many elders? How many elders? My elders tell me regularly, man, it's, it's always something, right? It's always something. You got six or seven, eight. I don't know how many you got now. You got a lot of elders here. It's always something. Because we as a people, we like to complain. Although Philippians 2.14 says do all things without complaining and arguing, we don't want to be different like that. We like to be like everybody else and we like to voice what it is that we don't like. And that's what ten men did here. And Caleb says, I'm not going to be like that. I'm not going to be like that. I, I'm going to be different. I'm going to rise above that. And brethren, you and I, we need to learn to do the exact same thing. I want to learn something else from Caleb. We just read verses 30 through 33. And, and we hit on it just a little bit. But this is a hard one. Don't you think Caleb had made good friends with these other guys? Maybe he knew them previously, but you spend 40 days on a camp out with other guys, you either learn to really like them or you're going to come to blows, probably one or the other, right? But more than likely, these guys, they got along. I mean, they had to work together to accomplish this. This was not an easy feat. But yet Caleb, he, he didn't give in to his peers. And sometimes that's what we do as Christians. Sometimes we act like who we are around. And sometimes our opinions change based upon who we are around, don't they? Sometimes we will, we will voice this opinion, we will take a stand if we are with this group of people, but you let us be with this group at a different time, and what happens? Well, it seems like our opinions change. Caleb was not like that. Caleb just, the Bible says, Joshua 14, verse 7, and we'll get to that in a moment, but Caleb just he said, I said what was in my heart. I said exactly what I believed, and honestly, he didn't care who heard it. What about you and I? Can we learn a lesson from Caleb? He's a different kind of spirit. He cares more about what God thinks than what other people think. But what about you and I as Christians? What about you and I? Romans 3 verse 4 says, Let God be true, but every man a liar. What about us as Christians? And, and maybe we go into our workplace, wherever it may be. Uh, what do we do? Are we different than everybody else? Well, what about our, if our friends, their co-workers, and, and maybe they're talking about this or they're doing that, or are we willing to, to stand up and stand out? Or are we just a crowd follower? What about you young people? What about when you are, you're in school or, or you're out on a weekend and, and you're doing things? Do your friends look at you as being somebody that is different? Or do you just fall in line with the crowd? Because see, if you talk just like everybody else and you dress like everybody else and you act like everybody else and you do everything that everybody else does, then you're no different than everybody else and you're not a Christian. God calls His people to a higher standard. And Caleb understood that. Caleb knew. He says, I, I, I've got to do what's right. I, I've got to say what's in my heart. And it really doesn't matter what those around me are doing. Brethren, we've got to learn that lesson. We've got to learn it. We can't be a people that, that tries to straddle the fence and, and again be this way with this group and this way with another. That doesn't work with God. Again, go back to this morning, Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says your eyes got to be single. You've got to have a devotion that's focused on me. You can't serve two masters. You've got to pick one. We've got to pick one. Caleb chose. He was a different spirit. He didn't give in. You realize he obeyed with, without understanding everything? without having every detail about how exactly everything was going to work, flip over to chapter 14. Look at verse 6. is where we're going to begin our focus. Prior to verse 6 in chapter 14, verse 2 says the people, they murmured. They complained. Verse 4, they said, let us go back to Egypt. And they said that so many times, didn't they? It's amazing. But listen to verse 6. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb 
they spoke up. They spoke up, they ripped their clothes, verse 6, and they spake into the company of the children of Israel, and they said, The land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. He said, If the Lord delight in us, that He will bring us into this land and give it to us. Remember, I've told you, God operates on that if-then policy. If the Lord is on our side, we don't have a chance of losing. He's going to give it to us. He said He would. He says, a land which flows with milk and honey. Verse 9, only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. The people said the land, they eat up the inhabitants. They will swallow us down. Caleb says, no. He says, the people of that land, we will swallow them down. They are bread for us, he says. He says, for they are, their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But look at verse 10. But all the congregation, they wanted to stone them with stones. Can you imagine such a situation? Can you imagine being in the place of Caleb and, and speaking up and being bold and, and to the point that the people want to kill you? Did Caleb have all the answers? It's a fair question, right? Did he have every answer? Did he know exactly how it was all going to play out day by day, minute by minute? No. Did he deny that the people were big and strong? Did he say, now you guys are lying. Those people really weren't big and they really... He didn't say that, did he? He didn't deny that at all. In fact, honestly, he didn't know how God was going to work this thing out. He couldn't have. God was in control, and, but it didn't matter to him. He knew that God was in control. He was just like the wise man said in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct thy path. That's the way Caleb lived his life. And that's why he was a man of different spirit. I want to ask you and I, do we, do we know how everything's going to play out in our life? You know what's coming tomorrow? You know what's coming next week? Do you know exactly how your, your children and your grandchildren, how all of that's going to turn out and, and play out? And No. Do you understand everything in the Bible that you hold in your lap? If you say you do, you're, you're fooling yourself. You see, there's a lot of things in this life that, that I don't know. But I trust the one that does know. He's got it all figured out. And sometimes when it comes to the times that we live in, man, we worry ourselves sick. And we, we focus on all of these things going on. and I just don't see how, how this country is going to survive. How many times do we say that? I don't see how we're going to get through this. But brethren, I'm going to tell you something. Look at Caleb. He focused on God. He said, if God is for us, isn't that what Paul said in the New Testament? If God is for us, who can be against us? He says, we're more than conquerors, Paul said, when we're in Christ. Well, we, we've got it won. It doesn't matter. And Caleb understood that. And if I want to look to Caleb and, and learn to be more like him, I, I've got to do that too. Stop worrying about what you don't know. Stop worrying about what you can't control. And start trusting the one that's got it handled. Revelation chapter 4 describes God sitting on the throne and the Bible says around him was a sea like in the glass. Like in the glass. You ever thought about that? You ain't you was on that boat when it about flipped, right? Did the sea look like glass? No. Did, you ever been at the ocean and it looked like glass? Just smooth? No ripples? You don't see that, do you? But before God's throne, there's no waves. There's no ripples. There's no panic. He's got it handled. And you realize if we would understand that, and we would just hang on to that, everything else kind of falls into place, doesn't it? Doesn't matter what happens, does it? Doesn't matter. On the way down here tonight, I, I called a couple from uh, that I go to church with, and, and the lady had open heart surgery. She was in her mid 80s, and, and and I talked to the man, and his whole attitude was, "Man, God's been good to us." Oh, she's still in ICU, and she's hoping to get better, but he he just realized. He said, "God's got it handled. God's always been, good, and He's always been good to us." And it doesn't matter what comes our way in life. Trusting God. Caleb understood that. He didn't have to have it all figured out. Last point, and I'll be finished. Flip over to the book of Joshua, if you would. We want to look at Caleb looking back at all these things that had happened 
in his past. And when he's recounting this, I want us to see what he had to say. Joshua chapter 14, and we're going to begin in verse 6. I'll give everybody just a moment. Joshua 14, verse 6. It says, Then the children of Judah, they came to Joshua and Gilgal and Caleb, the son of Jephthah the Kenzite, unto him, and they said, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God concerning me there in Kadesh Barnea. Caleb speaking. He says, Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again, and we already alluded to this, as it was in my heart. I said exactly how I felt. He says, Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly follow the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereupon thy feet hath trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord thy God. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, and he, as he said, these forty and five years. Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And he says, and now, lo, I am this day, he's 85 years old. Caleb said, 45 years ago we wandered in that land and we spied it out. He says, now I'm 85. Listen to verse 11. And yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now therefore, he says to God, give me this mountain. Whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heard us in the day how that... He talks about all of those giants. Listen, I want you to understand one thing. Caleb never, never quit. He never allowed anything to stop him. Fear didn't stop him. Do you think Caleb was afraid? He's recounting this. Do you think when Caleb went in to spy out that land and you see these gigantic men, men of war, do you think he was afraid? You've got to be foolish to think that he wasn't afraid. Brethren, there is, there's no shame in being afraid. What's, what's the shame is when we let fear paralyze us and we make allow fear to stop us in our life. Caleb never said, I, I wasn't afraid. He trusted in God. Did Caleb ever say that it wouldn't be hard? What happens in life when things get hard for us a lot of times? What happens? Quit, right? We quit. When it becomes difficult and, and we think it's just more than we can do, we just, we just quit. Caleb said, I didn't do that. The unknown didn't stop him. Again, we talked about the fact that just because he didn't understand, he didn't, it didn't matter. He trusted in the one that did. I want us to notice something else. Age didn't stop him. He said, I'm 85 years old. And he says, I, I'm still ready to go. I'm not going to quit. One thing I've noticed in the church in the last several years is, is a lot of people allow age to stop them. They'll say, ah, I've done my time. I've done my time. It's time for somebody else to do that. But are we still alive and breathing? Do we still have hell? Do we still have abilities and things that we can offer? You see, brethren, I want to tell you, we can't quit. There is, we never come to a point in our lives that we just say, okay, I've got, I've got my, you know, my ticket punched. Everything's good and dandy, and I'm just going to kick back and, and you know, just wait for this thing to be over. Did Caleb do that? He said, I'm 85 years old. Give me this mountain. He said, I'm still ready to go right now. What about us? What about us? See, he had a different spirit. Brethren, if we could all be like Caleb, it would be amazing what we could accomplish. I want to tell you this last thing. How are you ever going to make a difference in this world if you're not different yourself? Is that a fair question? How do you expect to ever make a difference in the world if you're not different yourself? If you're just like everybody else, Expect status quo. It's not going to change. But if you will stand up, stand out, and be different, brethren, it, it's amazing what you can accomplish. It's amazing what God can accomplish through you. Tonight, I hope that you take something from the book of Numbers and the study of Caleb, and I hope tonight 
that you decide that you want to have a different spirit. And I, I can say honestly, I think a lot of you do have a different spirit. I hope you're a person that stands out wherever it is you go, not in any kind of uh, of way that brings attention to yourself, but yet people look at you as being a Christian. If people tell you from time to time, well, I didn't know you were a Christian, man, that is, that is the worst thing anybody could say to us. As a Christian, we should stand out to people. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, I beg and I plead with you to consider that tonight. Learn a lesson from Caleb. If you know what it is that you need to do, stop putting it off. Stop waiting and waiting and waiting and someday you're not going to get a chance to do that. Don't put it off any longer. Make that decision tonight. Those of us that are Christian, do you have a different spirit? Do you stand out to people? Do you, do you try to make a difference in the world or do you just hope to blend in and, and hope to sail right on through because that's not what a Christian does. Tonight, if there's anything we can do for you, why don't you come while we stand and sing?